Okay. Uh, let me give the floor right away to our uh, to Roberto Toniatti and then to uh, Marco Ventura. Roberto Toniatti is the, my supervisor and full professor of constitution comparative constitutional law at the University of Trento, and Marco Ventura is the director of the Center for Religious Studies at the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Uh, Professor Toniatti, the floor is yours. Oops. Yes, I think my microphone is on now. So, uh, good afternoon to many of you, good morning to some of you, good night to the rest of you. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, one of the good uh, contributions of technology to uh, academic dialogue uh, overseas from all parts of the world. Uh, also, nobody can claim to, have, uh, to be under a uh, jet lag effect, so we are all bright and, and, and well awake. Now, the topic is extremely interesting, and I'm grateful to Nausicaa for, let's say, alerting me on some very interesting developments, and in particular, if I may, to claim that family law is fully part of constitutional law. Now, of course, I don't want to deprive anybody of, of any, let's say, uh, academic claim to be in charge of the field. But certainly, constitutional law, at least in my own opinion and experience, has been quite late in considering uh, such uh, uh, dynamics, which in fact are very uh, significant. Now we have a shared interest in family legal pluralism, and we are going to explore today the potential of constructive alliances between religious groups and queer groups. Now, there is uh, in both uh, uh, groups an interest in promoting alternative family structures and in a way there is a convergence of such an interest in, in, a, in going out of uh, political or ideological claim and getting to a stage of uh, normative uh, settlement of such pluralism. And this is extremely interesting uh, because we are in a way considering uh, in, uh, in, in a future uh, perspective, what could a, normative, a new normative order be like? Uh, now, let me just for the sake of information, uh, recall the fact that in uh, just uh, very recently, uh, the Law Commission of the United Kingdom has issued a 458-page consultation paper on wedding law starting from saying that wedding law in England and Wales is in desperate need of reform. Now, I don't go any farther into this, but I would say that it is quite encouraging to see how the need for reform is, uh, is uh, uh, felt and shared by uh, a, an authority such as the Law Commission, and the report is very thick, as I said, 454 pages, but I think it is worthwhile to, to, be, uh, to, to look at be precisely because of the plurality of religious settings that is taken into account in order to try to accommodate uh, many claims and thus reach uh, a, a way of uh, family law pluralism, legal pluralism, which, of course, will inevitably uh, give some larger space to religious law to exist, to coexist together with state law. So I would say this is very fascinating, very challenging, very interesting. I'm grateful to Nausicaa for opening my eyes, and I'm here uh, in particular to learn a lot. So thank you all in advance. Now, Zika, I hope I haven't been too short. No, you've been perfect. Uh, All right. <laughs> Marco Ventura, Professor Ventura. Uh, th thank you very much uh, from my side as well. 
and um, welcome from the Fondazione Bruno Kester to everyone for this event. Um, special thanks to Roberto Toniatti and the colleagues at the Law School of the University of Trento, University of Trento in general for this very uh, stimulating uh, partnership. Uh, to Nausicaa herself, of course, for the great um, commitment uh, and work of uh, this uh, year as uh, uh, this, this workshop marks, uh, to some extent, the end of a uh, terrific uh, year of uh, investigation and, uh, and discussion on uh, uh, crucial topics. Um, my thanks uh, to the speakers who have accepted uh, to be with us today and to uh, all those uh, who are in the attendance. Um, uh, I would like to say um, uh, very little, uh, but still something. Uh, about uh, why we took an interest uh, from our center in this research. Now, our center is uh, devoted uh, to a mission which we describe as uh, um, a mission on religion and innovation. We, we intend to work in an interdisciplinary um, uh, a team uh, on uh, building a positive interaction between religion and, and innovation. And now, as I mentioned, this is uh, fundamentally uh, understood as an interdisciplinary um, effort. Uh, and uh, um, what this project brought to us is uh, a legal perspective and a legal perspective on uh, an area and on strategies and concerns which are extremely relevant for the transformation of religion. So um, mapping uh, the interaction between uh, this project and, 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 and this workshop for the sake of uh, our, our uh, time together today, and uh, religion and innovation uh, would, would really uh, require uh, a lot of time. I don't have the time to go into that, but I, I have the time to um, uh, 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 underline uh, the, um, the interest of such mapping. Um, innovation is not a term that we use, um, I'm also a legal scholar, uh, that we use in legal, in legal scholarship. Uh, well, uh, and for sure, we, we don't use innovation with a technical term. In 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 uh, uh, when we say legal innovation is a very general um, is a very general expression, uh, which doesn't compare to the technicalities of, for instance, uh, referring to social innovation, or to innovation in, in science and technology. Uh, so the, the 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 very first uh, uh, preliminary interest here is to uh, move a bit beyond a, a, a sort of uh, a, a superficial understanding of innovation in the law into an interaction uh, between legal experts and the communities of those who, who, who use innovation and who do innovation with a more conventional and technical and technical meaning. Now, Eric, uh, 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 as we uh, engage with this exercise in matters of religion, of course, this gets even more uh, uh, demanding and 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 and, um, and stimulating. Uh, uh, in, innovation for religion uh, is uh, a, a a big challenge, of course, and and talking about innovation is immediately talking about tradition, and uh, um, when uh, uh, religion connects to matters of family, of, of of kinship, of marriage, this is very clear. This is very clear. So um, my thanks uh, to all of you uh, um, from a perspective of uh, uh, our center, because having this research uh, in our center and uh, having this opportunity tonight for our center is indeed a, um, a, uh, 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 an addition to our um, investigation on uh, religion and and innovation in a very key area. So through this investigation, we have the opportunity to uh, understand better uh, the uh, future of social innovation as applied to family matters. 
um, the impact of social innovation on uh, uh, normative structures and, and the making of the law in all its uh, dimensions. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, indirectly, that, that's not directly the, the, the topic tonight, but indirectly, as we all live in a digital age, uh, we uh, also open our eyes to uh, interaction between transformations in the family, uh, in, in, in the interconnection between the family and religion and the digital, the digital transformation through uh, innovation in um, science and uh, technology. Uh, it's a very broad perspective. It's a very stimulating perspective. Uh, I think that uh, the great uh, um, quality of this research is uh, precisely into uh, enabling us to look at the big, uh, at a big picture while taking full uh, advantage from uh, experts with a very in-depth knowledge uh, so combining the big picture with uh, a very specialized and 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 deep uh, perspective on uh, um, on in the area. Thank you so much. Looking forward to um, uh, now hearing the presentations and the discussion. And back to Nausicaa. Thank you very much, Professor Ventura. I'll try to share my screen. Okay. It should be working. Can you see the slides? Can anybody tell me if you can see the slides? Yes. Well. Yes. It's fine. Yes. Thank you very yes. much. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, let's get started. Again, thank you everyone for, for being with us today. I think we will have, I'm pretty confident we will have a very interesting and engaging discussion today, looking at the cohort of speakers that have accepted to be with us today. My name is Nausicaa Palazzo. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Trento and uh, an affiliated researcher at the Center for Religious Studies of the Fondazione Bruno Kessler, that is the two institutions that have funded this research project. Um, uh, I have been working at these institutions in the past year. I will work there until November, and afterward I will join, uh, I will go to Israel as a postdoc researcher uh, to, to continue uh, researching these topics. Um, as to the partners, let me thank our wonderful partners, uh, and particularly Robin Fredwell Wilson, Illinois College of Law, uh, Silvio Ferrari, reference person for the International Consortium for Law and Religious Studies, Frederick Swenen at the University of Antwerp, Mariano Croce, uh, Università La Sapienza di Roma, Jaron Temperman at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, who have really helped me through lead and by participating today in this discussion, uh, developing the project. Uh, let me also say that we would like to publish um, the proceedings of this workshop. Uh, and let me thank Jeffrey Redding for accepting to co-edit the volume with me. Um, I also wanted to share how we wanted to organize the volume and, and particularly that we wanted to outline how a fam a family legal pluralism applies to queer, in queer studies, how it plays out in uh, law, in the studies in law and religion, and then of perspectives that more explicitly try to tie together the two, uh, the two fields of study. And uh, finally, in a fourth part with new directions that these convergences of interest might take. Um, let me start off by saying why we have chosen this project, uh, because uh, it, it seems that we are now to enter a post same-sex marriage world in the sense that same-sex marriage is either recognized or on its way to be recognized everywhere in the West, 
in the Western world. So uh, we might actually wonder if the struggle for the recognition of non-traditional families is over. And of course, the answer is no. There are many more families living under the radar of law, such as non-conjugal families, such as polyamorous families, and many religious-based families. So um, there is a misalignment between the law and the reality of families that this project has Apologies that this project try to understand how to fix, how to um, to fix. So the response is probably counterintuitive, in the sense that um, uh, the, the intuition, if you want, behind the project was that that there could be some interest convergences between queer groups and some religious communities and some religious groups uh, such as when it comes to regular uh, such as when it comes to recognizing more families or when it comes to recognizing these families through means other than marriage so i've tried to understand uh, what this how these interest convergences might look like and their transformative potential in rethinking the target of family law. So it seemed that the most valuable theoretical contribution to overcoming the risks associated with this misalignment came from the scholarship on legal pluralism, especially as applied to uh, family matters. And again, either uh, a religious perspective and the queer side of the debate were, were extremely interesting because they, uh, for instance, some scholars noted uh, that um, family legal plural, when it comes to family legal pluralism, religious groups have much more in common with queer politics than they have with liberal politics. So, uh, for instance, John Weedy Jr. has said that uh, covenant marriages or uh, Jewish chain marriages, of course, these uh, regimes are problematic from a liberal perspective. However, they might actually constitute, um, they might add valuable options to the state contract models of the marital family. They might be interesting alternative to state family law. And this is something that religious communities have in common with queer politics, again. Uh, so my research questions were two. Where have these queer and religious groups converged in the past in the field of family law? And two, what are the basis for future convergences in the West, and what are these convergences, strengths, and weaknesses? So, looking at past convergences, we will have today um, interesting case studies. For instance, uh, Laura Kessler will tell us about the doctrine of the reputed spouses in Israel. Uh, Nicola Barker will talk about the case of Bermuda. Uh, Robin Frederick Wilson will talk about very interesting U.S. bills trying to abolish marriage licenses. Um, the convergences I focus on are um, especially regard non-marital regimes that were introduced starting from uh, 1997 to prevent the recognition of same-sex marriage and same-sex couples, uh, and that ended up recognizing uh, uh, couples of friends and couples of relatives, so-called non-conjugal couples. And I'm especially referring to the case of Hawaii, Vermont, Alberta, Tanzania, and Victoria, and uh, to a proposed amendment to the UK Civil Partnership Act that would have recognized uh, under the under the law siblings and grandparent grandparents. But in in reality, these schemes were extremely disappointing because uh, their transformative potential was uh, very reduced. 
For instance, very few non-conjugal couples have registered, and I especially take Alberta as a case study to demonstrate how disappointing these schemes were. Uh, for instance, I have conducted a case law analysis of decisions delivered by the Alberta Family Law Court from 2007 to 2020, and it seems that no non-conjugal couple have, has registered um, so we might wonder why that is, and I think that the answers that I will try to analyze in my chapter are A, because the, the, the motives behind the schemes were bad, so they were driven by a desire to hurt LGBT couples, they were driven by a desire to prevent the recognition of same-sex marriage. Therefore, uh, I think that uh, this is strictly linked to the second aspect. They were poorly drafted. So legislature did not pay much attention to how, uh, how to the condition to needed for the, to, to recognize these families. And they took the marital family as the model. So again, if you look at the Alberta at Alberta's law, you can see that uh, in principle, any two people can register, any two people in an interdependent relationship. Then the law says that you will be ascribed status if you inter alia are in a economic unit. But when it comes to understand what a economic unit is, the legislator uses terms such as conjugality, exclusivity or holding out as a couple that really make little sense as applied to non-conjugal couples. What does it mean for a non-conjugal couple to be conjugal? What does it mean for them to be exclusive? Of course, they can be exclusive in the sense that they might prioritize the, 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 the welfare uh, of the other person over the welfare of other person. But you again, you need to stipulate new meanings because as they are, they make little sense. So the risk, so uh, is everything lost? Should we give up uh, you, seeing these schemes as viable models for the recognition of new families? Um, I think, I argue no, because first, maybe the fact that we are now in a post-sex marriage world means that times might be ripe to move on to, 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 to build alliances that are not, that are expressly aimed at recognizing more family, at furthering different conceptions of good life, different conceptions of family, which is what we refer to when we talk of family legal pluralism. Okay, so maybe uh, we, we, can, we can build alliances, we can harness these convergences by making sure that these schemes are driven by a desire to recognize more families, a genuine desire to do that. And second, we as scholars might, uh, should be, must be more attentive and uh, insist that legislatures should stop using marriage as the model because otherwise uh, the, the transformative potential of these schemes is extremely reduced. And this is uh, the issue that I will address more at length in my chapter. So the second research goal was is to understand how the future convergences can uh, look like. And this is what we will find out today in the, during the workshop and we will focus uh, both on the recognition of non-dyadic unions and especially on the possibility for uh, polygamous unions and polyamorous unions to converge in, uh, in uh, getting rid of the monogamous paradigm engrafted into state law. And second, we will focus on Flex on the possibility for these two groups to converge on the introduction of flexible non-marital regimes open to more families along the lines of the schemes that I was uh, describing uh, describing now. 
uh, why we why should we harness this conversion? Why should we insist? Because besides the fact that it will reduce the personal cost of non-recognition and increase our sense of belonging to, to, to our societies, it might actually be a good uh, occasion to prevent the escalation of social and religious cleavages in our increasingly diverse society because it eschews the dominant narratives of the culture wars that are very popular in the United States and that are uh, demonstrating how dramatic consequences can occur. And uh, Jeff Redding will talk about how these convergences, how this friendship look like in a very divided society as the United States are right now. Um, yeah, I'll stop here and, and stop sharing my screen. And I would thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, maybe I can pick them, I can answer them at the end of the first panel. So if you agree, I will ask Pat Ada to uh, introduce our first panel. Thank you very much for your attention. You hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Aga, um, and I'm, I have the honor to chair the first panel. I prepared a, a little presentation, but Nausicaa's like extensive introduction, I think, you know, covered all the areas and I was instructed to be very strict with time. So I will start by limiting myself. I know you're more interested in hearing, uh, uh, you know, the papers of our uh, uh, guests. So um, the, the first rule is I was instructed to keep each presentation to 10 minutes and I was also asked to be very strict. So we're on a bit of a tight uh, schedule. There was a, a last moment change in the order of, of papers, I believe. So the first one <clears throat> to speak today is Robin Fredwell Wilson, who's going to talk about disentangling marriage in the state. Robin, you have 10 minutes. <coughs> wow, you. that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So let me see how I can do on that. The first big challenge will be just to get the PowerPoint. <laughs> to do this. Don't start my clock yet, Peter. Okay. Um, so can folks see this? Yes. Can you see this? Okay, great. So I'm going to do my best to blow through this in 10 minutes. Um, first, I just wanted to thank Nausicaa and also Isabel, who have done an amazing job. Marco for the long partnerships across a lot of time. And I also want to just say hello to Jeff Redding. I haven't seen you forever. And Fred Geddix, I see you a lot, but haven't seen you since COVID and hello to, to many new friends. So I wanna talk about a movement in the United States after same-sex marriage to try to disentangle marriage and the state. Uh, I agree with many of the opening comments that we're in a post-same-sex marriage world. Um, I want to show you that some social conservatives would like to take us to a post-marriage world because they're so concerned about same-sex marriage. It's almost as if they didn't win the culture war around same-sex marriage, and so now they want to take their toys home. I'm going to suggest that that move to disentangle marriage, which was a reaction to same-sex marriage in cases like Obergefell, which brought that um, to the whole uh, country, who, which opened same-sex marriage to everybody in the country, that, um, that this is actually a destructive move on the terms of social conservatives themselves. And then I might argue that it's also, I think, very bad for women um, and, and, and any other vulnerable person. So um, Chief Justice Roberts is a place to pick up with a Obergefell and he in dissent, um, of course, being the only dissent that he had read from the bench in 10 years, um, in the first 10 years of his tenure. Uh, wax is about how people of faith can receive no comfort and the treatment that they receive from the court. In effect, saying that they lost the ability to control the outlines and contours of marriage, and so there would be these reverberations. Some of the early reverberations were people like Kim Davis, um, who was the famous clerk, famous quote, clerk in Kentucky that took it upon herself to block people from their legal right to marry. 
um, citing her own conscience. Um, long story short, uh, the ACLU sued. Uh, the state of Kentucky ultimately had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for the ways in which she humiliated a male couple that she made stand there for a long time while they were waiting for a license. Now, these are just sort of one-off kind of pushbacks against the state. But then you get people like the then governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevan, saying that in effect, the, 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 the court had changed the definition of marriage. And when they did that, they created this problem for people like Kim Davis, that was the claim. And then he wanted in particular to take Miss Davis out of that role. Um, and some of that role comes from the way that we've licensed marriage in the United States. In other words, you can't get married without the license in most places. We do have 13 states that still recognize a version of same, uh, I'm sorry, common law marriage. But generally, you need this little piece of paper. So one of the first things that he did was to try to remove the provision of that paper from people like um, like uh, Kim Davis. So you can get it now from a vital record search on the Internet. I don't have any particular problem with how people get the piece of paper. I do think the piece of paper is important. I think it drives home the solemnity of, of the of the duties or obligations being being um, being taken on. But um, there we are. Now, this idea that we should unwind marriage—it's a thicker notion than what the Kentucky governor was talking about—that we should end marriage. It's very much linked, as I show in some early work um, after Burgafell, very much linked to the traction that same-sex marriage was getting in specific um, decisions um, in the United States. So this is a, a particular way of looking at that through um, a device called um, uh, Crimson, um, the Harvard Crimson um, searches. What we have seen, though, are lawmakers after Obergefell then trying to disentangle marriage in specific ways. So this is a gentleman who's in the Missouri legislature, um, Rep. Barry, and he wants the state as one cut not to recognize marriage at all. So marriage would now become this exclusively religious institution with no legal effect whatsoever. Now, I know folks on this call, I think, think that's a great option to have in the menus of things that we might do. Um, I think it may be misguided on the terms that religious conservatives bring themselves. And I'll show you that in just a second. A second cut at this is this gentleman in Indiana who has several times introduced a bill also getting no traction um, in, in terms of actually being enacted. But he just wants to make marriage completely contractual. This is a difficult problem because you know, he kind of wants to say you have to bargain to whatever the outcomes that you're going to have between between the two parties. Um, there'll be some public policy limits, like you couldn't waive, for example, child support. But if you wanted to waive the right to have any property um, interest in the earnings of the couple, which is something that would normally come from marriage in the United States, you could do that. Now, I think this is going to be very destruct destructive, especially to the interests of vulnerable persons, read across large groups, women and children. Now, in the United States, we may be different than people on this call. And I was interested, Nausicaa, that you'll be spending time in Israel, where I've also spent a lot of time because they have a very different project. But in the United States, you every religious marriage has civil effect. In fact, it is a misdemeanor um, or a regulatory violation in every state in America to bring into existence or purport to a religious marriage without civilly registering it. So what that means is every religious marriage has civil effects. There will be civil marriages have no religious implications because the people didn't, that's not what they think about or wanted to do. Um, now, one of the big pushbacks against same-sex marriage were all these religious leaders saying that they would continue to religiously marry people and refuse to file. And in effect, that move is not unlike um, what Rep. Berry wants to do in Missouri, so that we'll have like a religious thing and the civil thing is entirely different. And I think that's going to be very destructive for, um, for vulnerable populations. So I think we're at a place in the United States where some people are trying to deal with this postmodern same-sex marriage world by transforming the relationship to marriage. I think there are better ways, like trying to write specific rules for religious actors. You taught in a law that they did before Obergefell, but after same-sex marriage came to their um, state.
Okay, so why do I think that, that keeping religious marriage and civil marriage together can be a good thing? Well, I think there's some good baggage of religious marriage. In other words, if you look across large studies, you'll see, although the effect sizes are small, that people who are religiously married have less, less divorce, less domestic violence, they're happier, which seems strange to many people who see religion as, you know, sort of keeping people down, but their self-reported happiness is greater. They're more collaborative, they're more faithful across time. They seem to be more stable, but it may be too early to tell. So in some sense, by keeping religious marriage and civil marriage together, if religious marriage is having these good effects, it's sort of dragging up the mean. Mm -hmm. Um, other reasons to worry is when I think you cause this rift between religious marriage being over here and civil marriage over there, i.e. you don't register the civil piece of it like the first things um, religious leaders or Barry would do, then I think what's going to happen is that the people who are religiously married may misstep very easily. They may not know that they need to have it civilly registered. They may not know they need a second um, event, in effect, a second status in order to be protected societally. And if they don't know those things, then I think the weaker parties will be stranded without remedies. Now, we could, in theory, solve this with education, but it's very difficult to talk to especially insular religious communities and get them to understand that. I'm going to use an example out of Great Britain, so I was interested to hear about these new reforms in, in the updating of marriage law, because that's where one of my primary examples come from. So many of you know that for a time there would be people who um, were insular minorities within um, Great Britain um, being forced to have the dissolution of their marriages decided by Sharia courts because in effect their marriage was off the grid. It wasn't being seen civilly by the state. And those have important um, implications for the baseline protections that the state gives to vulnerable minorities, and it's something I've written about at length. But the long story short is, let's say that this, this the, these folks are married up here at the top, and that the woman and the um, the um, man um, have a, a child in common, a daughter, um, and then he dies. So he's going to pass away. What's going to happen um, in under Sharia law is that if he has a mother and a father, a lot of his estate is going to go to them. And only 25% is permitted to go to the wife under some schools of Sharia law, not, not all, okay, but some schools. And were the same thing to happen uh, and the background law in Britain apply, she would take that entire estate. So you can see immediately that there are repercussions for not having your marriage civilly recognized. And in this case, it's not malign. It's the way that, that the state um, put marriages on their radar, I suppose. Now, I, say, I think there's a second reason to worry about the approach that basically um, Rep. Lucas in Indiana was trying to push, which is we just, you know, we'll let everybody contract and the state will not set these background rules. And I think that's um, a problem because we know factually that, that, that couples don't sign contracts, okay? We also know factually that there are you know, unequal bargaining position of, um, let's say, the, the generally the, the largest wage earner being men and then women being more vulnerable. Um, there will be gaps in their contracts. In other words, I worry that people won't know the kinds of things they need to contract around. I'm always shocked when I start my first day of family law with like a little quiz about, do you know that this is the background rule um, about sharing of property? Or do you know this is the background rule about alimony? Or do you know this is the background rule about what? And there are thousands of these rules and they don't know. And they're in law school. So if they don't know, ordinary people are not gonna know what to bargain about. And um, beyond that, the state provides just to, by one federal account, something like, you know, 1,035 different uh, benefits that track to marriage as a status. Some of them come from marriage, but they're requiring third parties to do something for the married people. A private contract cannot bind the bank not to take your house, for example, or something else. And so that contractual model is going to lose lots of protections that were carried with marriage. And that's going to be a challenge for the people who have the of a menu. And then I think I'm on my last point. And I suspect 
out of time. Um, I think we will also lose the channeling function of marriage. I think marriage has had the ability to channel people into stable relationships because it kind of increases the exit cost. Um, and in this contractual vision, I think you're going to lose the ability to regulate at exit in a thick way, and that may actually destabilize marriage. Now, some of us may see destabilizing of marriage as a good thing. Um, I'm not trying to take a normative view of whether it's good or not. Um, my only point is that the religious conservatives, I don't know how to stop sharing that, sorry. But my only point is that the religious conservatives who have pushed this, I think have not appreciated the implications of what they're doing. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, you almost made it on time. Uh, it was really professional and a very amazing uh, kickstart to this evening's uh, afternoon's discussion. So next, next one is Jeff. Jeff, you are going to talk about personal status loss. So the floor is yours, and we can try to keep it to ten minutes or so. Okay, great. So uh, today, my comments. I want to build off uh, two previous articles of mine. Uh, the first one is called Dignity, Legal Pluralism, and Same-Sex Marriage, and it's from uh, 10 years ago uh, in the Brooklyn Law Review. And the second piece is uh, called Slicing the American Pie, Federalism and Personal Law, and it's um, from 2008 in the New York University Journal of International Law and Politics. Robin to mute her microphone. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, one of the primary arguments of my uh, Brooklyn Law Review article is that there is a way of doing family law that navigates a middle path between state coerced uniformity in family law and on the opposite end of a spectrum here of sorts, private ordering, uh, which Robin has just spoken about, where the state has little to no role over care and responsibility contracts drafted and agreed to by two or more adults. So this middle path or, or personal um, law um, is one that we see instantiated in many places around the world. So in my Brooklyn Law Review piece, I focus on the personal law system in India, but the work of uh, Yuxel Seskin uh, documents the instantiation of personal law um, in numerous countries, uh, many British post-colonial countries. So in India, the personal law system uh, dates um, from uh, at least the colonial period. And under it, different religious communities, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, others, uh, are governed by different family law statutes, norms, and, and case law that grows up around um, all of the uh, statutes and norms. So these, um, focusing on the statutes, um, these statutes have been promulgated or legislated um, from central secular bodies, um, parliament, for example. Um, and, these um, central bodies tend to be averse to pronouncing upon a, uh, a religious community's family law practices without religious community input and acquiescence. Okay, so there are many critics of personal law systems, but I think um, both supporters and critics would agree that personal law systems make family law not only very visible, but also very political. And with this visibility in politics, I think um, some of the dangers of private ordering are avoided, as are some of the dangers of state coerced uh, uniformity. So given all this, the Brooklyn Law Review article makes the additional observation that queer family form formation does not have to follow either a simulation into heterosexually authored, majoritarian and monolithic family law of the state, nor does queer family formation have to fall into the potential dangers and inequities of the world of private ordering, as Robin just described. Rather, um, a separate and better queer family law can be accomplished through a personal law process that recognizes not uh, simply religious diversity, such as in India, but sexual diversity too. Of course, you know, such a proposal is eminently controversial um, and it hasn't gone anywhere uh, much uh, since my article, uh, but my Brooklyn Law Review article um, read along with my NYU uh, Journal of International Law and Politics article, offers a robust defense of queer personal law. Okay, so perhaps the most important criticism that I had to respond to with these articles and, and still do respond to is that personal law is not a model for lawmaking or law enforcement that has historical precedence or resonance in the United States. 
In short, the criticism here is something like the general critique many compared to this space. You know, your foreign example is very neat, but it is totally historically and culturally inappropriate to our, the American context. So I think this uh, criticism is wrong for two major reasons. So um, the first reason is that some US states, uh, California and Connecticut, for example, uh, before Obergefell uh, had started to go down the queer personal law road before their efforts got stimmied by uh, litigation. So in both California and Connecticut, formal same-sex relationships were basically um, substantively equal to different sex marriages at the state level, but were organized under a different name, domestic partnerships, civil unions, for example, and different state statutory frameworks. You know, um, while substantively, um, um, there was a lot of overlap between domestic partnership and civil unions in California and Connecticut and, and, and marriage, I think the different statutory frameworks could have allowed in the future, if they've been allowed to persist, um, for queer and straight family law to have uh, productively diverged. For example, different norms and rules around parenthood, monogamy and adultery, and property division and divorce could have developed. Um, on this note, I, I will say that I think uh, straight people have issues, anxieties, and problems in these areas that many queer people do not share. Um, with regards to children, uh, I think this is a you know a common um, issue that comes up, and I think having you could have an altogether different statutory framework that gets triggered for any kind of family with children. Um, and you know, here I, I think we um, uh, need to remind ourselves not to uh, let uh, babies and children overdetermine uh, family law, much less queer life. So my second sort of uh, defense of or, um, or response to this uh, critique that you know the U.S. doesn't have a personal law system and never can is that the entire U.S. system of geographically distinct state-based family law, U.S. family law federalism, in other words, is a kind of personal law system. And so the big argument in my NYU piece um, is that you know geography and territory are not neutral facts or natural realities. Um, states and their borders are as much cultural and historically contingent constructions as different religions and religious communities are. States' borders and states' laws do not automatically stop at rivers, mountain ranges, and the like. Extraterritoriality of state family law has waxed and waned over time, uh, given political interests and priorities of the moment. So again, territory, like religion, is in substantial part political. Um, and U.S. political life and constitutional tradition, so as a result, U.S. political life and, and the constitutional tradition in the U.S., I argue, is comfortable with um, personal law, territorial personal law. Um, and I think queer personal law could just be, be seen as another iteration of what is, in, in, in effect, the American personal law system. So I'll just end there. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Jeff. That was amazing. You really managed to do it in under 10 minutes. And the next one on the uh, on the list is Mariano Croce. Mariano? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me well? Yes. Mariano is going to talk about juridification. And Mariano, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. First, a big sincere thank to uh, Nausicaa Palazzo the institutions that have funded the event, the rest of the organizing team for organizing such a, a, an interesting workshop on that puts together so many respected scholars on such a topical issue. Today I'll be talking as a political theorist, which is my job actually, and recently I have been tackling the relationship between juridification and depoliticization. This is the background of my paper while mine will be a plea for juridification as politics. So I, I will talk about sexuality issues mainly, but I'd like to, to make it clear that initially I got to this topic by studying pluralism in multicultural societies, multicultural settings where religion-based and faith-based groups lay claim to jurisdictional autonomy. So my argument today applies to a variety of groups. As it is truly pluralist, in a sense that unfortunately I won't be able to vindicate, vindicate fully today, uh, my argument applies to all organized groups. So mine basically is a normative claim based on a legal pluralist analysis. In the existing literature on depoliticization, the increasing use of law as a medium to tackle social and political issues 
is deemed to be detrimental to the legitimacy of political processes. Against this view, I argue that juridification can be key to giving life to new forms of politics. Um, in, in my research in particular, I argue that the recognition of non-conventional and family assemblages is a successful example of how a politics of juridification could and should work. Juridification can be described as the growing use of law as a medium to tackle a variety of issues that were traditionally addressed by legislative and administrative action. My argument is that such a definition fails to capture one of the key characteristics of today's juridification. It is not as much a legal phenomenon as it is a political phenomenon. As such, it is my claim that it is to be studied as the vehicle for a novel kind of politics. Today, the importance of juridification can hardly be exaggerated. It bears resemblance to more traditional phenomena, such as judicial activism, judicialization, but actually juridification marks a broader change in the relation between representative politics and the legal field. Ron Herschel captures a distinctive trait, he argues that traditional forms of judicialization can be regarded as an intrusion into politics from the outside. Judges are said to have a political agenda, one that lacks democratic legitimacy and seek to implement it through judicial decisions. And in so doing, judges are claimed to overstep their competencies to the potential detriment of political institutions. On the contrary, juridification bespeaks an inner transformation of politics. A transformation that is favored by political agencies and citizens who have recourse to law. And as John Comeroff emphasizes, the legal field today is becoming the venue where citizens articulate their claims relating to such fundamental issues as the culture, race, sexual orientation, faith, habits of consumption, and so on. In the face of it, while most scholar most scholars, especially in the, in the field of queer politics, queer studies, are suspicious of the normalizing effects of legal recognition. And please don't get me wrong, I am very sensitive to this kind of critiques, alarming critiques. I make the contention that in the present political scenario, juridification is a resource, though always risky, like all resources. Why is juridification risky? I think everybody knows in this, in this audience as four decades or so of queer critique has abundantly demonstrated is that especially but uh, not only with reference to the quest for sexual rights political battles carried within the legal field with legal instruments are dangerously ambivalent they recognize and misrecognize at one and the same time this is the gist of critiques of juridification rights that legalize and protect certain conducts, certain forms of life, tend to naturalize them, tend to efface the political character of all types of, in, of inclusion and exclusion. And this is naturally the case with legal measures accommodating same-sex same sexuality, uh, where same-sex sexuality is just as natural as opposite-sex sexuality. Um, based on a, my claim is, is different than this, although sensitive to this, uh, based on a theoretical backdrop that draws from legal institutionalism, legal pluralism, and actor network theory, I advance a view of juridification that calls for a new sensitivity to the normativity of social assemblages and suggests revising the role of law. I know this is a broad sweeping claim, but revising the role of law within contemporary liberal democracies. Um, uh, I cannot delve into this framework now, but the main feature is a particular understanding of how normative contexts come about and how the state should recognize their normativity. So against two centuries and even more of state-centered, state-based models of law, uh, drawing from this literature, I show that the normativity of the state should feed off the normativity of social assemblages. What does it mean to make room for the normativity of social assemblages? 
If we understand juridification as a process whereby social actors reach out to legal institutions to have their claims heard, legal institutions could and should rethink their activity in a way that opens spaces for social actors to verbalize what they do, how they organize their assemblages, what the symbolic and material resources are that they use to set them up, what they think they need in order to make it to continue to exist. In this way, the law is not called upon to provide what my colleague uh, Frederick Swenen calls a badge of respectability. We've been working on this together through inclusion into something that is already included in the legal law. On, on uh, quite the contrary, the law would first and foremost draw from the transformative potential of assemblages as they engage in negotiation with greater institutional networks, such as the state, of, uh, the state apparatus. The transformative potential of these assemblages lies in using law to negotiate normative recognition of a body of normativity that could feed in many ways into the broader legal body uh, and could extend the broader legal body, the state legal system. On this account, official legal courts could become the space for verbalizing a set of needs and requirements that cut across a, var cut, cut across a variety of contexts. Debate of this sort within courts would not only relate to self-interested in one looking concerns, Rather, they would be oriented to the creation of bodies of legislation that do not build into existing law and thus can expand the ex existing law. So, uh, Swen and I call this contractualization and with a bracketed R. So, contractualization is a relationship uh, recognition model that signifies a movement from contacts, the way assembly, um, uh, members of assemblages may contact, to contracts. It is a movement by which legal institutions look into concrete assemblages created by social actors to understand the way they themselves create their points of contact. So as far as non-conventional family configurations are concerned, legal recognition should work as an ethnographer, one who seeks to pinpoint the actual stuff that is involved in the creation of networks whose members think that they should be officially recognized as members of a network, of an assemblage. This recognition model uses juridification, that is to say the increasing use of law as a political means, as an effective instrument to bring about the multiple ways in which they themselves, social actors, self-organize. And the way this self-organization can be consolidated with recourse to a legal proxy, so to say. Thus, a contractual model is a juridified one in the sense that social actors temporarily become policy makers who do not simply consolidate their own assemblages. Um, uh, do not simply consolidate their assemblages because the interaction with state agencies has the potential to construct bodies of regulation that can apply to other assemblages, to other networks, as the appropriate circumstances arise. In this frame, the state's competencies wouldn't be either reduced or effaced, they would be rethought. This, I claim, would kindle a new kind of politics that could productively complement more traditional kinds. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Mariano. It is good to see you again. Uh, you did a very professional job. You really did your 10 minutes on spot on time. Thank you very much for this. Uh, next, uh, next one is uh, Antonio Barcelona. Uh, do I see you, Antonio? Yes, yeah. I'm here. Hi, how are you? And uh, your paper is going to be on function recognition, the case study of Italy, and you have 10 minutes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you very much. And I also wish to thank the organizers of this conference and the institutions which have founded it, and Nausicaa in particular, for, for the invitation. Um, yes, I um, uh, will apply a private law perspective to my brief introduction to the topic I would like to share with you, um, which is on uh, how basically we could start thinking a different notion of a family, uh, starting from a cri general critique which has been developed towards uh, marriage. 
We all know that in the Western legal tradition, the uh, mainstream uh, notion of the family is basically rooted in the notion of marriage, which has always been considered as a, um, a relationship between two parties, most of the times uh, a male and a woman, although in recent times it, this notion has been opened in most of the Western legal system also to same-sex couples, a sexualized couple and a couple who is made potentially to have kids. So this notion has been a lot, uh, very much criticized because of many of the things that has been said uh, already today for being very exclusionary. And um, this political uh, criticism has also been used a lot also to expand the notion to same-sex couples and to, let's say, try to make politically a, a more open notion of family. However, many has been the criticism, and I uh, really much appreciate it, for example, the ones carried out by Nicola Barker in, in his books, which I read a couple of years ago, um, how also uh, the expansion of the notion of marriage, of the, of the family and marriage to same-sex couple could be very exclusionary. Um, and this specifically also with respect to the topics we are treating here today. It's clear that polyamorous and poly polygamous families are excluded from the notion. It is clear that mutual age families are excluded from the notion and all kind of other kind of families which are not based on the sexualized couple are excluded from the notion. We could go on by more and more examples, but I think we all have them here. So I was thinking as a private lawyer, what can we do in order to try to find a different notion of family? Because I really agree with the fact that somehow law has to intervene in family matters, basically because of matters of equality. So what could it be a different notion of family? Where can we find this? In this sense, I am primarily a, a property a law scholar, um, and I have seen that the path that the family law has followed, it was very different, and it was, it's not very different from the one which has been followed in property law. In property law for many years, it has been said that in order to a fight against uh, poverty, let's say, to include <laughs> into property somebody else, we should have given more properties, find ways to give more property and more property spheres to more people. And this was the, um, the um, politics which has been followed in the 80s and the 90s and which most of property scholars upheld during the period. But now what is happening is property law is that we're starting to think on uh, a different path which is basically try to deconstruct property and not to expand the same property to those who are usually excluded from it, but try to deconstruct property in order to make it as an inclusive institution, which rather than maximizing profits, tries to uh, do distrib distribution, for example. So I was thinking whether we could try to make the same, uh, the same approach to family law and basically to marriage. Where could we see and so basically try to find a more inclusive notion of family, which can be more flexible, and so try to move forward from a path which just expands the same structure, trying to include who is outside of it, being at the, at the, at the end of the day is always exclusionary. And by looking at my own legal system, which is the Italian one, but maybe we will see that this uh, reasoning could be applied also to other legal systems, I have started to look in which would be the field of family law which could allow me to do this, technically I'm speaking, to do and try to do this kind of research. And, fun fact, exactly as in property law, most scholars have started this reflection looking at possession, namely the de facto situation related to property, I have uh, realized that we could do something very similar looking into de facto, de facto family unions. And then try to explain it better. De facto family unions, that we all know, are those uh, family uh, relationships which are developed out of wedlock. Um, and Many, many systems have, like the Italian one, for example, have found the protection of family, of, of de facto family unions outside of statutory law. For a long period, de facto family unions in Italy uh, have been protected through uh, the application of common principles and rules of private law to situations which are, so, uh, and a statutory law was, was lacking. Only recently a statutory law was, was introduced, but there's a general agreement among private law scholars uh, that the scope of application of the de facto uh, family law uh, uh, and the, of the discipline of de facto family law still has to be uh, researched and looked for in the previous case law 
which has been developed before the application, before the enactment of this new statute. And this is very important because it is precisely the scope of application which can be drawn from this scale law that sketches the legal notion of family, which appears extremely relevant for our purposes. I'll make you, I'll give you two little examples of case, Italian case law, which has uh, expanded to, beyond the notion of a spouse, um, the notion of family, to show you how from this we can draw a different notion of family, which I think it could be very interesting and, and somehow useful for, uh, for further discussions. One of the first rights that the Italian uh, Supreme Court, which is called Corte di Cassazione, have extended beyond the spouse um, already at the beginning of uh, at the end of the 90s was the right of the partner of a um, de facto uh, couple to be compensated for damages in the case of uh, loss of, uh, of one of its partner. Why? What was the reasoning that led the court to extend, to extend this right, which has been uh, normally considered only belonging to spouses, also to a de facto partner, uh, being in a relationship out of wedlock? Well, actually, it was just application of tra traditional principles on torts. What were the, 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 um, the requisite for it? First of all, a relationship which entailed an economic support and cooperation between the parties, which stability allowed to generate the expectations of its lasting in the future because they legitimate uh, a monetary loss, and then a strong personal bond between the parties so that the death of one of them would, would cause in the other a severe emotional and physical pain. So this would be the non-monetary loss legitimation. So this element actually are not, said the court, proper only on spouses, but also to any sta stable relationship based on mutual moral and economic support. And this is the first, the first notion that we can find. So it's a stable relationship based on mutual moral and economic support, the relevant definition of family that the court found in this case law. But then if we checked on all the other rights which has been extended from spouses to de facto relationships, this is always, always the uh, notion that we will find. A fun fact, it is not a notion that has been, let's say, copied from one case law to the other. It was a notion that emerged from the bottom up in uh, facing uh, concrete situations of need. Another example is the extension of some kind of legal protection to the partner um, with respect to its position with reference to the common home uh, when only one of the two partners has a title on, this, uh, on the flat or on the place where the couple or the family lives. Here, normally, the Italian, cor the, the Italian courts, before uh, this uh, overruling, which is from the 90s again, or the beginning of 2000, said that the uh, partner of a civil, of a de facto union should be considered as a host. This way, the title owner on the common home, the partner who has a title on the common home, could kick him out without any notice. Then these um, approaches has changed and the court started starting to say that, that, of course, like a partner cannot be considered as a host precisely because she does not have a relationship as a host with the uh, title owner. But with a title owner, they have a mutual a relationship of mutual support, economic and moral support, which is developed within this common home. And precisely because of that, we need to grant some kind of legal protection to the non-title holder. So again, we find again the same notion, basically a stable relationship based on mutual and moral and economic support. But we can really well see that all these case law, these two case law that we have seen, could have been perfectly, perfectly compatible with a situation with a purely amorous family as long as it could have the, um, these, these, uh, these elements, so a uh, relationship which could have been, should have been um, stable enough, or also to a polygamist uh, de facto family, or also to a mutual aid family. Uh, so going beyond the gender, the number, the sexualization of the relationship, so we're finding a very inclusive notion of family. And it's important to note it as this notion of family that we are mentioning, we can find in the whole Italian case law on de facto relationships, and which has shaped the construction of their legal prerogatives on de facto relationships. I am, during my uh, research, I've also seen that we, this kind of approach can be also found in other legal systems in Europe and somehow can be found also in the case law of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. And especially on that uh, case law of the European Court of Human, Human Rights, which has developed the notion of family with respect to the application of Article 8 of the, of the Convention, which I recall to all of us, which is 
somehow this is European law union because we recognize the European Convention uh, of Human Rights as part of, of uh, EU law. So I'm getting to the, to the conclusion since I uh, want to stay within the 10 minutes I was given. Um, my point would be this, so uh, if we really try to dig technically into uh, the fact of family, in many legal systems, and Italian wise an example of this, we can see that we can find a, um, another notion of family which could help us to depart from the idea of broadening up the structural institution of man on marriage uh, to those who are excluded from it and paves the way for a reconceptualization of family according to a more inclusive and flexible notion, which is the functional notion of family, which is the one that I've mentioned before. Of course, here there's a big challenge, which is the challenge that has been raised already during um, the, the, our uh, reflections today, which is, well, how do we want to implement this notion? Should it be uh, a notion which we, which we, from which we make, which has the effect to grant directly rights and duties from the legal system? Should it build up a status? Should it be contractualized? This here, here of course, uh, we would need to reflect politically um, within the tension and the constant tension between freedom and equality, which we constantly have to deal with in family law. But well, such a notion already, the other important thing is that such a notion, of course, within, of course, through a counter-hegemonic and maybe my, minoritarian interpretation, but we can find it in the law, and we, so it exists in the law, and I think that is strategically very important. It is also strategically very important to know that such a notion was developed by the case law, and it is not only the case of Italy, which was just an example, um, in front of different practical needs. So it emerged from the bottom map with respect to practical needs, which sees that actually the family which we can design from the needs of a familiar unit, um, design this kind of notion rather than a structural notion based on a, a legal lien of, of marriage. So if this is true, and I'm concluding this, we will still need to think, even constitutionally, with respect to fundamental rights and pluralism, if it makes any sense still to found a notion of family based on a legal lien, let's say, irrespectively on any factual, as, uh, any factual assessment of the action situation of the people, while on the other hand we can consider, uh, if it's any legitimacy to consider irrelevant, the actual existence of a strong mutual support and a stable relationship between the people independently of the gender, sexual orientation, and a number of the people uh, with respect to the law. I think that could be a, a very good uh, strategic tool we could use constitutionally to uh, try to um, let's say, start a reflection and a critical reflection on a notion, on a different notion of family, which could be more inclusive in the terms that we're interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so the next speaker uh, is Laura Kessler. Laura. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, but can we, oh yeah, we can even see you now. So uh, Laura is, is going to talk um, about law and social movements for family equality, and she's going to talk about specifically Israel. Laura, you have 10, 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Oh, well, so thank you, Nazika, for inviting me to this conference. I'm really so happy to have the opportunity to participate despite our uh, separation by time and geography. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, I'm going to share a piece of my larger research on the strategies employed by activists and civil rights lawyers to liberalize family law in Israel. Um, uh, this research is supported by uh, a senior Fulbright award as well as the University of Utah where I'm a faculty member. So I just wanna start with some background, um, by way of background, I mean, Israel's personal status system, um, as many in the audience probably know, uh, was inherited from the Ottoman Empire. Um, it continued in largely the same form during the British mandate and after Israel became a state. Um, and uh, this system uh, really is officially state, uh, in this system, uh, official state recognized religions retain exclusive control over uh, marriage and divorce. Uh, there's no civil marriage in Israel, uh, unlike as Robin uh, discussed uh, in the United States, uh, we have 
uh, civil marriage, but not in Israel. Um, matters concerning personal status are determined according to the religious affiliation of the parties involved. So, uh, for example, um, if you're a Jew, you must be married by a rabbi in accordance with uh, Jewish religious doctrine. Uh, if you are a Muslim, you must be married according to Sharia law, uh, and so on. Uh, pastors and ministers may marry Christians according to Christian religious doctrine. And so, um, as, as you'll see in this slide, uh, there are actually 14 recognized religious communities in Israel, um, and each recognized religion uh, has its own legal system. Uh, the religious law of each respective community governs personal status matters, and uh, in particular, and importantly, uh, there's exclusive jurisdiction over marriage and divorce uh, of each uh, religious community. So, um, I, the recognized religions in Israel are generally very traditional and patriarchal in their outlook um, and their uh, doctrines. And uh, this is uh, actually a picture of the uh, members of uh, 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 the highest, uh, the, the rabbinate in Israel, the highest uh, court. Um, and, and so this is uh, just I thought that illustrates, uh, you know, all men. Uh, all Orthodox men um, making decisions about marriage and divorce, um, at least for Jews. Um, and you see the same pattern um, in Sharia courts um, as well. Okay, so what is the result? Uh, this leads to a discriminatory treatment of women, of same-sex couples, um, interfaith couples in matters of personal status and uh, particularly marriage and divorce. Um, I think that uh, the most, uh, you know, the example that many people are familiar with is the GET system. Um, and according to Jewish law, a man must grant a bill of divorce or a GET, um, and a woman must accept the a GET um, for a divorce to occur. Uh, because um, there are actually exceptions that apply only to men, um, a husband can actually is free to remarry without a divorce um, if the wife doesn't accept the GET. Um, but the wife does not. And so what is the result? Um, the results are, are twofold. Um, first of all, um, as Nazika uh, referenced in her introduction, um, some women are chained or trapped in dangerous or dead marriages. Um, they're uh, called chained or agu agunot in Israel. Um, but I actually think the larger uh, effect, the systemic effect, is that this affects uh, the inequality of the parties uh, with regard to the ability to divorce bleeds into negotiations over property support and custody. Um, so for example, a husband may condition his cooperation in granting a get upon a series of economic demands ranging from economic concessions related to marital property, spousal support, child support, or custody and visitation. Um, and so uh, really the widespread and systemic effect is uh, you might call uh, blackmail in uh, the economic consequences and divorce in, in the negotiations. So uh, I have, uh, uh, the next thing I'll note obviously is that uh, because of the patriarchal uh, ideology of the recognized religions in Israel, um, that same-sex marriages are not, uh, you may not contract a same-sex marriage in the state of Israel. Um, interfaith couples may not marry in Israel uh, uh, because uh, they, everyone, uh, parties are married according to the, uh, their religion. And so uh, that's not possible if there's an interfaith couple. Um, and then more generally, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the religious monopoly over marriage impacts the religious uh, freedom of all, all Israelis. So I have uh, some examples, and in light of the time, I'm going to skip this one. This is a, 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 a case of a woman who was trapped in a domestic violence relationship in, in a marriage for more than 20 years. Um, but I, I'll move on to some other ones that I think uh, people might uh, maybe are less widely understood in terms of how it works in Israel. Um, so this is uh, Lucy Aharish and uh, Saki Halevi. Um, Aharish is a popular TV anchor in Israel. She, uh, um, uh, she's a Muslim. Um, uh, Halevi is an actor on the Netflix uh, series Fauda. Uh, he's Jewish. Um, because um, all legally recognized unions must be performed by a Christian, Muslim, Jews, or Orthodox Jewish clergy, there's no way to le legally for Israel's to marry outside of their faith um, unless they go abroad to another country, in which case, if there's a valid marriage entered into in another country, if they return to Israel, their marriage will be recognized. Or if one person converts to the other uh, religion, um, of course, which is very onerous, um, it could be a lengthy, arduous uh, uh, process, as well as, I would argue, of uh, potentially a violation of religious uh, principles of religious freedom if the person doesn't want to convert. 
Um, so this couple had a non-binding ceremony and a private ceremony, but there's no way for them to have a, a legal, uh, contract a legal marriage in Israel. Uh, the next example, um, this is a couple, Aviad and Seal and Raz. Uh, they met in a uh, university, in Ben Gurion University. Um, homosexuality is condemned in Orthodox Judaism. Uh, they may not let me legally marry in Israel. They did have a commitment ceremony, um, and then they eventually married in the United States. And even though the, re the marriage is, is registered uh, in Israel, they, their IDs actually would technically still um, say single. Uh, now, the next one I want to talk about is, I think uh, many people are not as aware of, uh, who have, don't study the personal status laws in Israel in particular. Um, so there are uh, nearly immigrants from the Soviet Union in Israel. Uh, they came under the law of return, uh, granting every Jew a right to immigrate to Israel. Uh, they have grown up and spent their entire lives in Israel. They've served in the military. They've gone to Israeli schools. They speak Hebrew. Um, but rabbis give them all kinds of hassles, the rabbinate, rabbinate about uh, pr to, to proving they're Jewish. And it's very basically impossible to go back into the Soviet bureaucracy to prove uh, one is Jewish. And so um, hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, Russian immigrants in Israel cannot legally marry in the state of Israel um, and so without uh, converting. Um, so Hadush, an organization which tracks this issue, reports that more than 700,000 Israelis may not legally marry, uh, which is more than 5% of the population. And, and I think that's a very important uh, point uh, in terms of uh, the context of Israel, because it's not just uh, certain groups or minorities like, uh, you know, the, uh, gay and lesbian families. It's really a, a very large uh, constituency of people who may not legally marry in Israel because of its personal status system. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, the response of what I call reform and resistance, uh, I, I, because I only have 10 minutes, I'm just going to really talk about one, uh, one, uh, one development, which is uh, the rights of unmarried cohabitants and reputed spouses. Um, but so I'm just going to talk about the second uh, example here uh, in terms of what the developments have been uh, in response to personal status laws. I do want to say that um, one uh, area that I think is very interesting is that there are starting to be developments inside religious law, uh, including progressive interpretations by religious courts of religious law because of the uh, pressure to modernize. And I think that's actually a very interesting source of, um, of modernization of the law potentially, which is not in the civil realm, but in the religious realm. But I'm not going to actually talk about that. I want to talk now about uh, reputed spouses. Um, so um, Israeli law recognizes unmarried cohabitants to an unusual degree uh, compared with other developed countries. Um, indeed, it's one of the most progressive countries with respect to partners without formal marital ties. Um, reputed spouses are afforded a wide range of rights that are almost identical to the rights enjoyed by married couples. For example, uh, community property rules, um, implied obligations of support, uh, economic rights of couples for purposes of pensions and government benefits, uh, rights to recover in tort for personal injury to one's reputed spouse, um, all apply to non-marital partners. Um, and I think it's important to note here that this reform came about largely because of demands by the Soviet, uh, the Russian immigrant community, uh, that a very large percentage of the population in Israel was not did not have access to marriage and demanded it. Um, and then ultimately, what happened was that because of civil rights litigation, same-sex couples uh, were added. Uh, they, they argued that there was a, a violation of equality to give uh, certain immigrants. Uh, Russian immigrants, the right to um, uh, heterosexual couples, essentially the rights to uh, be reputed spouses, but not same sex couples, and they prevailed. Uh, and so now as a result of that litigation, same sex couples can access their rights as reputed spouses, just like different sex couples. Um, because Israel has so many restrictions on marriage that's reflected in state sanctioned personal status law, uh, many Israeli couples find themselves cohabiting outside of marriage um, and increasingly out of protest. Uh, many Israeli couples uh, who can legally marry in Israel are actually choosing not to do so. Uh, couples who don't want to be married uh, according to, uh, uh, you know, fundamentalist religious rules or orthodox religious rules. Um, the Israel Central Bureau statistics data indicate that 300 percent, a 300 percent increase in the number of Jewish couples choosing to live in cohabitation without marriage uh, since 2000. Now, I realize I'm basically out of time, but I guess I want to end with uh, an assessment, right? Uh, uh, what are what what are the takeaways from the developments with regard to reputed spouses in Israel? 
Um, and how does it fit into the theme of convergence of interests and family law among religious and queer constituencies? Um, I guess I would say uh, it, we, it's, it, we should be cautious. Um, the valiant efforts to reform personal status in Israel uh, and to, has achieved more pluralism um, and it's brought out significant legal changes, uh, really new rules of the game, so to speak. But the rules, however, reflect many of the same features as patriarchal personal status laws. Um, legal scholar Rita Siegel has dubbed this preservation through transformation, a process through which uh, privileges maintain uh, through rules um, even though the rules and the rhetoric uh, change. And why do I think this? Uh, for two reasons. Um, first, and I'm wrapping up here, um, first of all, the reputed spouse's doctrine is for all intents and purposes marriage, especially in its practical effect. Um, it's been critiqued as illiberal in that it imposes marriage-like -like obligations on parties ex post who never intended to be married. Um, I think this is a very persuasive argument, especially given that the reputed spouse doctrine is applied at the end of the relationship, not at the beginning. Um, and then I think uh, all the while, um, even though you might argue that the, this doctrine isn't really super progressive in terms of uh, family pluralism because it imposes a heterosexual normative model on unmarried couples, but all the while the existence of the pluralistic alternatives postpones, I would argue, the introduction of civil marriage in Israel and more pro pluralistic models. And one may even see the robust partnership rights in Israel and, is, and, um, and the personal status laws as part of a symbiotic system with each enabling the other. So in the end, uh, while there are more choices, a robust pluralism in family law is not the result of reform um, and have not occurred uh, so far. I went a little over, so thank you so much. Uh, Peter, your microphone is not uh, switched off. Okay, um, sorry. Um, so thank you, Laura, very much. And now we have the, the last speaker, Nicola Barker from the University of Liverpool, who's going to talk about religion and sexuality in the Bermuda same marriage litigation. Nicola, the floor is yours, and please try to fit within the 10 minutes uh, limit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen with you. Is that working? Yes. Yeah, you can see? Yes. Okay, great. Yep. Um, so thank you, Nausicaa, for inviting me to speak at this workshop and for the previous um, presenters for your fascinating papers. Um, I'm going to talk about one example of convergence and divergence between different religious perspectives and the LGBT community in Bermuda. In my previous work, I've critiqued same-sex marriage from a queer feminist perspective, and my own preference would be for the institution to be dismantled rather than expanded. Um, but the Bermuda situation was particularly interesting to me because the fight for same-sex marriage in Bermuda became essentially a dispute between competing religious beliefs rather than kind of the usual situation of religion versus the LGBT community. So in 2017, Bermuda became the first country in the world to have had same-sex marriages take place and then legislatively withdraw the right to marry for same-sex couples. A year later, the Bermuda Supreme Court then struck down that legislation as unconstitutional on the grounds of religious freedom, not on the grounds of sexual orientation. The Bermuda Court of Appeal upheld that decision and this resulted in same-sex marriage being reinstated, um, although the case is still pending an appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London, which is the final appellate court for Bermuda, and that case will be heard um, later this year on the 7th and 8th of December. But I believe the judgments of the Bermuda courts are significant um, because they represent the first time as far as I'm aware that courts anywhere have recognised that same-sex marriage is not only about equal protection for LGBT plus people, but also about protecting a diversity of religious and non-religious beliefs. So as the Chief Justice of Bermuda noted in his decision, his decision in the Supreme Court vindicates the principle that Parliament cannot impose the religious preference of any one group on the society as a whole. So same-sex marriages began taking place in Bermuda in June 2017 following a decision of the Bermuda Supreme Court 
that by not issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples, the government was unlawfully discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation, contrary to Bermuda's Human Rights Act. But the backlash began even before this judgment had been handed down, <coughs> excuse me, um, following a petition in favour of same-sex marriage that had gained about two and a half thousand signatures the previous year. And the main organisation leading the charge against same-sex relationship recognition of any kind was called Preserve Marriage. <coughs> So despite close links to conservative Christian churches in both Bermuda and the United States and its aim to uphold marriage as a quote special union ordained by God between a man and a woman, preserve marriage actually appears to downplay its religious influences by presenting itself as concerned citizens rather than as an explicitly Christian organisation. But there's little doubt that they did in fact seek to promote a particular conservative version of Christianity. And nevertheless, despite the apparently secular arguments presented by Preserve Marriage on its website and in public campaigning materials, the Christian basis of the opposition to same-sex marriage in Bermuda was acknowledged by many of the individual MPs who spoke during the parliamentary debates. A month after the first same-sex marriages took place in Bermuda, there was a general election and the Progressive Labour Party won a landslide on a platform that included support for civil unions, but not same-sex marriage. So they introduced the Domestic Partnership Act of 2018. And this act is the result of a political compromise between those in the party who wanted no recognition at all of same-sex relationships and those who wanted to allow same-sex marriages to continue. So domestic partnership is a comprehensive alternative to marriage and it's available to both same-sex and different sex relationships. The Domestic Partnership Act was then challenged in the courts by Roderick Ferguson in the centre of the photo there, Mary Ellen Jackson on the right and an organisation called Out Bermuda who represent the LGBT plus community in Bermuda. So in Bermuda, there is no constitutional anti-discrimination provision protecting against sexual orientation discrimination. The previous litigation in the Godwin case had been one based on the Human Rights Act, which is an ordinary statute and had now been overridden by the Domestic Partnership Act. There's also no constitutional right to marry or protection for private and family life. So a constitutional challenge to the Domestic Partnership Act appeared at first glance to be a lost cause. In fact, the Chief Justice quickly dismissed most of the arguments made by the applicants in Ferguson out Bermuda. But out Bermuda had built coalitions with religious groups and individuals who supported their application. And they went on to become co-applicants in the case, which proved crucial. So in this way, the litigation in this case became not about sexual orientation versus religion in the way that it's generally been framed elsewhere, but rather about whether the state can prioritise one set of religious or non-religious beliefs over another set of beliefs. And the two constitutional provisions engaged in this case were Section 8, Protection of Freedom of Conscience, and Section 12, Prohibition of Discrimination on the Grounds of Creed. So Out Bermuda had two strands of argument. The first was that the Domestic Partnership Act was created for a religious purpose, contrary to Section 8 of the Constitution. And the second was that it violated both the right to freedom of conscience and that it discriminated on the grounds of creed, because their claimants included individuals with religious and non-religious beliefs in the institution of marriage. And both religious and non-religious beliefs are protected in the Constitution. It's the freedom of conscience argument in the second strand of Out Bermuda's case that, in my view, is potentially far reaching. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So as part of that strand of, of argument, one of the co-applicants, Ms. Hayward Harris, who is a minister in Bermuda, told the court that the Domestic Partnership Act prevents me from conducting same sex marriages, something was, which is an important part of my religious beliefs. And on behalf of the Wesley Methodist Church, another co-applicant in the case, Dr. Gordon Campbell noted that after the first same-sex marriage litigation, religious organisations were able to choose whether or not to perform same-sex marriages. But the, the Domestic Partnership Act was the result of several churches and individuals 
having persuaded the government to enact their religious belief into law. So he said, when the law comes into effect, everyone, whether they hold that belief or not, will be bound by those churches and individuals belief. On that date, our congregation will lose the right to choose for itself whether or not to perform legally recognised same sex marriages. And that was a key argument in persuading the Chief Justice to find the DPA unconstitutional. So Chief Justice Kaywilly concludes that just as preserved marriage and its members genuinely believed that same sex marriages should not be legally recognised, the applicants and many others equally sincerely hold opposing beliefs. It is not for secular institutions of government without constitutionally valid justification to direct the way in which a citizen manifests their beliefs. The Court of Appeal upheld the Supreme Court's judgment and reasoning in relation to freedom of conscience, and they emphasised that belief in marriage, whether opposite or same-sex marriage, is a fundamental one, and that following the decision in Godwin, Bermuda law drew no distinction between the two until the DPA became law. And same-sex marriages have now resumed in Bermuda pending the judgment of the Privy Council later this year. To conclude, I just want to say that these judgments are really striking in their reconception of the relationship between religion and LGBT plus rights. They overcome the way in which gay rights and religion are presented as in opposition to each other. And they correctly, in my view, identify the importance of marriage to belief systems, not only of conservative Christian churches, but also LGBT plus individuals and gay friendly religious organizations. The judgments <laughs> recognize what Minister uh, Walton Brown said in introducing the Domestic Partnership Act, that some religious bodies support same-sex marriage. Their beliefs, as well as the beliefs of those who seek to marry for non-religious reasons, deserve to be protected just as much as those of the more dominant religious beliefs that oppose it. For the religious individuals and organisations seeking to perform same-sex marriages, the compromise of the Domestic Partnership Act is irrelevant. It's not a question of whether the legal rights of marriage have been or can be replicated for same-sex couples. It's about the meaning of and access to the institution of marriage itself. When the debate is framed in this way, it becomes clear that it's not an acceptable compromise to impose the beliefs regarding marriage of one group on those holding contrary views. Marriage is an important religious institution for people of many different faiths and should be open to same sex couples who share those faiths. But I wonder if the next logical step in the marriage as religious freedom argument is that there should not continue to be state preference for marital relationships over non-marital relationships in terms of the package of legal rights and responsibilities that accompany the institution. And it's in that next step that I think radical potential may lie. My voice just about made out. Um, thank you for, for your attention. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Nicola, very much. Uh, thank you for a very interesting paper that nicely kind of wraps up the whole uh, panel. Also, thank you very much for uh, keeping, uh, you know, to the clock. It was, um, anyways, we're 10 minutes behind, even more than that. Um, I was really listening uh, attentively to your presentations and I could not notice that there were many points of convergence and divergence between the, the papers, different approaches, different points of view, <clears throat> uh, different people focused on different things. So I was wondering whether before I give the floor to the audience, whether you would like to ask each other one another uh, questions of interest, um, um, critiques, uh, suggestions, uh, highlighting uh, different points of view that you might think that the other person had missed in their presentation, so you think that put a, a different emphasis on issues which were not as, as important as you would think. So, would anyone like to raise a, a comment? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I ask Robin, um, I, I was really interested to, to hear about the different proposals that have been made um, for essentially abolishing marriage as a legal institution. And one of the things that struck me, of course, is that that's something that feminists have been calling on for quite a long time um, from various feminist perspectives. And so I was wondering about what your thoughts are on kind of coalition building between feminists and 
who, people who would be their natural enemies, <laughs> um, the social conservatives, um, you know, towards this kind of common goal? Or is that something that you're kind of completely dismissing out of hand because of the negative motives of, of the religious uh, social conservatives? Yeah, so I actually talk about that irony in one of my pieces that they are like sort of ripping a page from decades before um, the eliminate marriage movement without realizing it because they're so angry about having lost control over the definitional point. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of coalitions, as you probably know, um, and have tried to bridge differences in the culture war. But I think on this, it, it, the, the, the priors that would bring people to the same place are so different. Some, you know, really, really, really respecting marriage, but then being, you know, so pissed off about having lost control. Um, and then folks who think, no, we shouldn't have marriage at all, that the preference to marriage is um, wrong and um, harmful to diverse families. Um, that I, I think there would be no coalition. Now, I should also say about on the right, I think there are, if this is an ill-formed movement, um, I don't, you know, I think it's important to stop it in its tracks. I think the, the thinkers on the left who have spent time on this have a coherent account of what would happen, have to happen in the system of all family law regulation in order for women and vulnerable children to be kept. It's not, by the way, I should always pause and say, it is true that men can also be vulnerable. I'm talking across large groups, okay? But um, they have a, a, a thick account of what would have to happen. Um, the people who wanna just toss marriage don't have a thick account. They are just mad. Um, and you can look at their bills to understand that. So, um, and I think, you know, trying to bring those bills to a place where the, where the feminists and the people with a thick account um, would have value to add, I, I think might be impossible. So, and I wouldn't want to leave it to those guys by themselves. Let me just say that point. Okay, next question I had from Nausicaa. She wanted to ask a question. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, I would like to ask a question to uh, Mariano uh, because I was supposed to ask this question last time we virtually met, but I forgot. And it regards uh, the paper you uh, have written with uh, Frederick Swenden, Contractualization. So uh, first I recommend uh, people in the audience to read it because it's really interesting. It disaggregates the monolithic conception of family into modular components. And then at some point you say, dependent on the applicable modules, other branches of law could also tie in. I think you refer to public law benefits, but I'm not, I'm not clear. And if so, how public law benefits could tie in? Well, a, a preliminary discussion should be made about the way this connection between public law and different branches of private law within civil law systems, of course, a, but not only, but I have uh, civil law systems in my mind, first and foremost, are also instruments to um, a assign privilege to particular types of relationships. So I don't think one can make the argument that um, new recognition, relationship recognition models should be fostered or envisioned before, I mean, getting the dirty hands with rethinking uh, the benefits related to public law. So I think that when, when the, the reason why I usually construct my argument in this way is that a, a, a family law within um, a family law, which is really in between private and public law, but and public law have to be rethought hand in hand. It is impossible to say that a, a new model has to be implemented without saying that 
uh, you are also affecting taxation. You are also affecting something that I wanted, unfortunately, uh, Robin has to go, but this is something that I wanted to ask, but the channeling function. I, so we are saying that a specific model has to be, um, has to be favored because of the stability uh, it, it grants. Okay, so um, when I say, when we say, that probably uh, Frederick will be saying something uh, um, about this, but when we say that pieces of, pieces of uh, public law um, have to be rethought uh, while implementing new uh, bodies of law uh, arising from family law assemblages, we are also saying that basically we are um, we are also making an argument for rethinking the welfare state, for example. So it is impossible, and this is this is why I'm I'm finished. And uh, this is why this is a very broad argument. It is impossible to advance this without saying, well, you are completely rethinking the state in the way it was uh, a constructed in the last centuries. Yes, I think just uh, changing this little piece of a uh, family law, but not only family law, also uh, uh, branches of law involves rethinking the state from, from scratch. This is a nomadic claim, I know, but I think we should uh, uh, think of this as in parallel. And so I'm saying that I can't uh, reply to all your question in any proper and satisfying manner. Thank you. Frederick, would you like to add? something on this, since you're the co-author of Mariano? I would like to add a lot, uh, but I, I propose I do it in the second part because I will partly address this as one of the one of the issues against trying to broaden the family to other, uh, to new types of constellations in relation this has with welfare responsibilities of the welfare state. Um, but I will skip uh, this one, I think, and, and come back to it later. Well, I don't think we really have too much time, so I'll ask around if there are any questions in the audience and then maybe we come back uh, to you. Okay, are there any questions in the audience? Yes, I, I, right as I was exiting, Mariano, you said the channeling function of law and I thought, oh no, I have to go back. So I came back for just a moment to say, um, I appreciate your comment. I actually think that um, if you start with marriage as a building block of society, then you need to worry very much about how you expand the menu and whether the things on the menu are going to serve the same salutary functions for society, but also protective functions of the two people inside of it. Um, and that was my fear about the social conservatives, that they actually believe this thing is a good building block. We could disagree about this for a moment, but they believe that. And so if they're going to lose the channeling function because they're pissed off about their post same sex marriage world, they've harmed their own priors. I think you to I think the channeling function doesn't matter so much if you're willing to scrape the whole thing and start over in a radical way and build blocks um, that are deliberately designed to be protective of people against vulnerability. Um, but I think it's a very dicey proposition um, and I think a hard project and we haven't done so well with our hard projects. So I guess I'm skeptical to, to, to chuck some things that are protective now of some of the people, but certainly not of all. That, that, that's my thought. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Roberto. You need to turn your microphone on. We cannot hear you. You need to press the red microphone. Yeah, you're on yeah. now. Um, it it is uh, it is a question uh, for anybody who cares to, to 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 give an answer to make a comment. It's not really a question. In the European Convention of Human Rights and the Chance of uh, Human Rights, of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, we do have a right to marry. Uh, I wonder, first of all, uh, what is the reaction of a system like in Israel, for instance, where I understand there is no right to marry? 
at least for a small group of, uh, of citizens. Secondly, is the right to marriage going to become a duty to marry uh, in some context in which uh, alternative marriage life is not allowed and it is even uh, uh, repressed? So, I, you know, I, I, I fully appreciate now the, the importance of the right to marry in both European uh, charters. And uh, I see that they are not really representative of a uh, universal approach to marriage. So I think it, is, it would be an interesting starting point for uh, elaborating more uh, on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, would you like to react, panelists? Some of you? No. I can say something about yeah. um, about the right to marry in, in Bermuda. So Bermuda is also subject to the European Convention on Human Rights as a British overseas territory. Um, so if someone from Bermuda wanted to claim their right to marry, they would take the UK government to, to Strasbourg, not the Bermuda government, because the UK has responsibility for international relations. So theoretically, um, Article 12 would apply to Bermuda. Um, but they haven't incorporated it into domestic law. So the Bermuda domestic courts cannot enforce that right. They, they would have to go to Strasbourg. Um, and of course, we know that Article 12 at the moment doesn't include the right to marry for same sex couples. Um, so it's not particularly useful from, from that point of view. Um, but the case of Oliari in Italy was very influential in Bermuda in creating the domestic partnership provision. And I think had it not been for that case, um, the Domestic Partnership Act would not have been created and it would simply have been a straightforward abolition of marriage um, with nothing replacing it. So in that sense, the, the European Convention was, was very influential um, in Bermuda. Okay, um, let me collect the last round of questions before we go back to Frederick, who, who had like uh, an idea how we wanted to move the discussion forward. So are there any other questions from the audience? We have 38 people uh, online with us. Are there any, any one of you who would like to uh, comment and, or ask a question? Okay, I'm gonna wait five seconds. Maybe someone pops up. Um, I don't think. Oh yeah, there's Joe, one of the panelists. <laughs> yeah, I, I I just wanted to um, think through Laura's observation that you know legal pluralism, um, while presenting kind of uh, many many choices, can often preclude um, things like civil marriage. And I just wanted to point out that this was something of an issue too in same-sex marriage debates in the U.S. at one point in time where um, people were wondering whether there was a right to marry that was embedded within the U.S. federal constitution and maybe not within the different states. So thinking about through, thinking through the kind of the radical plurality of, of family law and what I call the American personal law system and, you know, 50, at least 50 jurisdictions um, within the U.S., there is, you know, remarkably um, no, um, you know, no, no federal marriage as such. I mean, uh, there is federal family law as many scholars have kind of, you know, thought through, um, but there isn't, there isn't this sort of US federal marriage. There's just uh, state marriages. Okay, um, Laura, would you like to react? Your microphone is off. Oh, there's a lot to react to. Um, I guess I wanted to respond to two things. Uh, First of all, in terms of the um, the right to marry, so Israel doesn't really have a constitution per se. And I'll just note here that um, it's basic law, which does provide for equal rights of its citizens. Um, the Supreme Court has interpreted that law to uh, accept uh, personal status law. So personal status law is the big footnote in the right to marry, uh, the equality rights in Israel. Um, so I, I'll just note that. Um, but I wanted to uh, say that, um, I think it's really important not just to look at formal law, and I, that's especially important like in Israel. For, uh, so uh, I do think, even though I'm critiquing it, that uh, reputed spouses is a functional equivalent in marriage for a very large percentage of the population. 
Um, and so even though there's no right to marry in Israel, there's um, this, uh, the reputed spouses give most of the rights of marriage. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, I'm not sure if Jeff was asking a question. I just have a response, I think, which is that, you know, I teach family law and I think there's a remarkable amount of uniformity in despite the federalist system in the U.S. across states, um, both because of the constitutionalization of family law in the U.S. and because of uniform laws, which states have adopted uh, model laws that are proposed by experts. Um, so I, I, th I think it's really interesting to think of the U.S. as a plural legal system, but I'm not sure it is. Uh, to the degree as, as some um, uh, systems that have uh, personal status systems. So I'm not sure what to do with that observation, um, but I think there's more uniformity perhaps in the US. But I take your point that there could be less, right? There could be more pluralism yeah, in our, I, I, in our I, system. I, I, it wasn't a question, it was just kind of an observation yeah. about some synergies in, in pluralism between US and Israel.